Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Brown Symposium concurrent session 1B, Creating Smart, Resilient, and Sustainable Cities Through Planning, Design, and Engineering. It's a lot to cover in 45 minutes, um, so we'll try to give you an interdisciplinary sneak preview, sneak peek into the meanings, aspirations, and some of the challenges related to urban sustainability resilience and smart city um, idea and uh, applications. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers for this session. My name is Zorica Nedovic Budic. I'm a professor of spatial planning and technology in the Department of Urban Planning and Policy at UIC. I relatively recently joined UIC after 15 years at our sister department in Champaign which I left to spend seven years at University College Dublin in Ireland and then returned to the US in 2017 to take a position of the department head for three years, um, just finished in January. Uh, being transatlantic, uh, my involvement has mostly be, been through European and North American associations of planning schools. And before my return to the U.S. Uh, in seven, 2017, I led a five-year interdisciplinary 30-partner European project supported by European Commission Framework Project 7. Uh, the project was called TURIS, which is in Gaelic means a journey, and it was about uh, transitioning toward urban resilience and sustainability, so quite on target with uh, our presentation today. Uh, my esteemed colleagues who are joining for this panel are Sibyl Deribel, who is a professor of urban engineering in the Department of Civil Material and Environmental Engineering at UIC. He is also the director of the Complex and Sustainable Urban Networks Lab. <laughs> professor Deribel is originally from a sp small French archipelago of Saint Pierre de Miquelon of the east coast of the US that has population of 6,000 people. So thinking about sustainability already of places um, and people. He's uh, the author of a textbook, Urban Engineering for Sustainability, published by MIT Press. And he is an associate editor of the American Society of Civil Engineers, Journal of Infrastructure Systems, and for Cleaner Production Matters. Our um, third uh, presenter, uh, Continuing with our international, quite international panel, is Professor Kier Alkudmani. He's a professor of spatial planning and urban design at the University of Illinois Chicago. He has a PhD from University of Illinois Champaign, uh, and he has published um, six books and over 100 papers. Uh, before joining UIC faculty, he worked for the Chicago firm Skid Skidmore, Owing, and Merrill, SOM. So um, I'd like to um, follow up on this introduction of our uh, panel. Welcome you again, uh, you all, and start with a brief introduction of our session theme, focusing mostly on some of the key uh, terms and some of the key pointers um, as they are um, noted in um, literature and our work. So starting with sustainability, uh, we already heard that it, it has a, a, a long-term, uh, it's, it's an idea of a long-term um, uh, care for our natural resources, for our earth. Uh, the concept was developed from uh, 1987 with Brutland's report uh, that uh, uh, proposed an uh, intergenerational, multi-generational thought about the environment, uh, but also other uh, aspects of our uh, development, which included population, energy, uh, dealing with poverty, and so on. So it was quite a comprehensive and visionary complex uh, co concept, mostly associated with environment, but really the bottom line as it evolved became a triple, C, uh, triple E, which is environment, uh, economy and equity. And I would say that it's quite, uh, quite uh, relevant uh, to the contemporary state of, of, of our world and cities 
uh, and human settlements. Um, obviously, uh, planning as activity that deals with human settlements, uh, urban, rural, regional, um, metropolitan areas, uh, took on the concept very uh, early uh, and started to apply it in the context at various scales from regions to uh, localities. Um, just a few examples of these scales uh, are City of Chicago Sustainable Development Policy that started in 2004 and that has been used for some of the decision making in terms of financing major projects, housing, affordable housing, um, sustainable building improvements and so on. Uh, at the, also in our neighborhood is a more recent sustainability policy and plan of the city of Evanston, slightly different in scope and content, including uh, waste, energy, uh, ecological areas, uh, but again, uh, uh, an example of an implementation, and there are actually many examples across this country, across the world, an interpretation of the concept in the planning uh, process for uh, localities. Um, at the most global level, uh, most of you might be aware that the UN Department um, uh, uh, Development uh, Program, UNDP, has developed uh, 17 sustainable, sustainable development goals and has been promoting them uh, to be applied at national and local level throughout the world. The next concept uh, that we're covering is the concept of resilience, uh, which in my mind uh, is related uh, and started to come to the fore about I'd say 10, 15 years ago, and uh, coinciding with much heightened awareness of the climate change. Uh, again, the concept may have been applied before, but is becoming much more prominent now. It has to do with the capacity of the system, which means a full environmental system of our cities, uh, regions, um, and, and broader, uh, to actually uh, rebound uh, and come back uh, from crisis, but also even more so to adapt uh, in terms of uh, uh, changing itself and being able to uh, uh, to to uh, uh, invent new ways uh, of their of, of its own functioning to actually deal with the crisis. Uh, again, the concept has evolved from more ecological and environmental or natural disaster um, uh, focus to uh, a broader focus that includes uh, eco uh, economy and social, uh, economic and social resilience. Fundamentally, I see this concept also very closely related to planning uh, because to deal with resili resilience, um, uh, the, the key activity is uh, looking into the future, looking long-term and preparing. So it's something that we call contingency planning. Just to mention some of the uh, global or prominent activities at, um, at international level uh, is the uh, activity that is, has been sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, they have uh, now, I think, for over 10 years been uh, involved in uh, uh, 100 Resilience Cities project. Uh, they developed a city resilience framework with some of their uh, sponsored uh, partners. Um, you can see that they uh, see four key dimensions uh, as part of that framework. Uh, they also uh, fund a variety of, the idea was to fund 100 cities that would develop exemplary practices in, in urban resilience. Chicago is one of the cities. You can see the map on the left uh, showing cities around the world. <laughs> the research has also discovered that there are um, uh, certain practices that promote and enable resilience within urban areas. So you can see the list in the middle of the framework. <coughs> Excuse me. In addition, <coughs> in addition to these um, Principles mentioned there, there's also principles of diversity and redundancy 
collaboration and connectivity that are key to resilience. <coughs> Okay, the next concept is the smart city uh, that I think at its first um, kind of uh, reaction and, and how it tends to be interpre interpreted a lot is through computing, energy engineering, and digital technologies. Um, however, planners um, tend to take a broader view of what is smart and what is a smart city and with that broader view, you can see one of many uh, conceptualization of what it is and includes smart people, uh, smart economy, environment, smart government, which means transparency, access to information, democracy, um, uh, collaboration through government and other stakeholders using means, digital means, um, smart living and then smart mobility. So it's a very comprehensive view. In my own research, I have thought of four scales of um, using information and communication technology to enable various activities within the society. And that framework that I have developed and used is shown at the bottom, including the private realm, which is how we are, ourselves use the technology at the household individual level. You've probably heard about digital gap and still concerns about the access governance or the public realm where we deal with the government, government services and processes, economy or the productive realm where the actual activities, economic activities, industry, services, commerce is actually happening via digital means. Um, and then the spatial realm, of course, as a planner, uh, there is many ways in which uh, digital technologies and technology in general is impacting the cities, uh, their form, their function, the patterns, the movement of people through and goods through uh, different uh, regions and cities and so on. Um, so there are many aspects of, of smart cities that is impacting our life. Um, the couple of uh, photos there uh, that are um, in the slide, uh, show an example from South Korea, which is a new town of Sangam that actually had a portion of the city called Digi Digital Media City. South Korea was one of the leaders starting from early 2000s uh, in development and experimenting how they can provide digital uh, technology to the public and enhance their environment. Uh, again, thinking of these uh, tools as public uh, tools and providing providing them as public good, which I have to say haven't been the case much in the U.S. where it has been mostly commercial. So it has been seen both as beneficial for to the economy and uh, to the democracy and access to uh, various goods and services within the city. There has been many many terms uh, of that developed for smart city. Um, at some point, it was ubiquitous city, uh, the e-city, um, also uh, the triple A, which is the anywhere, anytime, uh, anyhow, um, anytime, anywhere, and so on. So there, again, the, the terms are changing, but the ideas are more important behind it uh, and how we can make these cities actually complementing and enhancing the quality of life. The most recent example uh, that that, that has been quite uh, popular and gained attention is the Keyside City uh, in Toronto. It was a project by Side, Sidewalk Labs. Uh, it has been cancelled in May due to pandemic. It has been quite controversial as, as uh, there's a lot of ethics and morals and, and concerns about equity and access that, that go with um, applying technology at such a scale. But it was an interesting example that also involved Google um, uh, in the process that had pretty much everything smart from pavements to waste disposal, water, buildings, and so on. And then to conclude this introduction, I just want to express that um, 
how I feel about what we know and, and, and what is smart and how we uh, gain uh, and learn from uh, what we have and how we move forward. I, I, I feel that um, we do have plenty of smartness uh, that happened in the past, in distance, and also recent past to learn from. Obviously, there were many mistakes that we also learned from, but uh, we have a long history of smart traditions, smart examples and practices in the ways that, the, in the ways that human settlements were developed, in the way that we dealt with public health, anything from infrastructure, sewage, water provision, uh, provision hygienic uh, conditions for housing, access to housing, uh, mobility and, and movement through space that is also promoting health. Um, so in that area, there have been many uh, uh, really good and excellent examples of cities around the world that have implemented um, ideas and, and have, have been functioning well. And also with disasters, again, uh, we had from hundreds and thousands of years ago, the locations of cities, the building, the way that we built, um, the cities and settlements were built, very much uh, took uh, care and and, and uh, awareness about the surrounding environment and the dangers in that environment. I think uh, we have maybe more recently gained more confidence in terms of uh, feeling that with technology we can defeat uh, the natural uh, forces and maybe relaxed a little bit. But I think if we go back, we can find many practices even more recently, but also uh, in the past, to, uh, how to deal with uh, some of the natural disasters. Oops, I'm sorry. I think I pressed the wrong button. So with that, I would like to conclude and move on uh, to um, giving the floor to my um, colleagues. I believe that sustainability, resilience, and smart cities are, um, I, th I, th I, th I think of them as labels, as guiding principles. Um, they could be uh, used in many ways, and they are used, defined in many ways. Uh, but then, uh, in order to be used at the local level, they have to be operationalized. And I think in that process, we, we are reminded of what is our common good, common interest, and these labels, I think, serve that purpose. There's a lot of criticism about the vagueness and lack of exact definition and so on. But again, I think they do use, uh, serve as a useful purpose, and they could be used as criteria for um, uh, keeping us uh, keeping or, or making us keep that long-term view uh, on our communities, cities, um, our, our um, earth and, and resources. Um, so again, I uh, suggest that we move forward with what we know. We, have, we know what the ingredients are. Uh, we even have some good cookbooks, uh, but uh, there are many uh, not many, maybe good cooks, <laughs> maybe better planning and planners that could put things together in an integrated way, keep uh, track of all the different factors that affect the actual implementation of plans, which is difficult. There's politics, there's resources, uh, uh, visibility of implementation that are constrained by various factors. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I would like to... Uh, give the floor to my colleagues. Um, Sibyl will talk about infrastructure and Pierre will talk about tall buildings, again, from the sustainability, resilience and smart city perspective. So Sibyl, if you'd like to. Perfect, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, uh, maybe uh, if you, I think, I don't, I don't know if I'm the one pressing the slides or if I'm supposed to ask you, sorry. I'm to, pushing uh, the slides. 
All right, perfect. Um, so by the way, I'm just going to put in the chat where I'm from, St. Pierre and Miquelon. Small, very small archipelago, 6,000 people. It's French, French owned. I'm a French citizen, French passport. Don't Google it now, but when we're done with the session, remember the name, Google it, you'll see where it is, and you'll, you'll quickly go to Wikipedia and, and try to get some information. It's a really nice piece of trivia. Um, so yeah, so what I want to talk to you about is, is the difference between good and bad smart urban infrastructure. I want to basically ask you a question. I'm not going to bring a lot of knowledge. I'm just going to bring a big question that has really been bothering me for a little while. Uh, can we just move on on one slide, please? Um, so let's, you know, if we look at this neighborhood, let's look at, at the people there. Uh, let's look, we see that, you know, people can walk around that it's fairly dense, there's a lot of shops. Um, so we can have this one in mind. If we move to one slide, please. And then let's compare it with this one, which is a typical suburb with a lot of, of houses and how different they are. And if I ask you from a urban design point of view, which one do you think is better? And I don't want to de define what better or worse is. You know, what is, do you think it's preferable? Which one do you think is better? Uh, so if we go, if you go just one slide again, please. Um, we, we all have a feeling of kind of what is good urban design and what is bad urban design. Good urban design, we're gonna have some element of sustainability. We do have to define it, but you know, we have some sense of it. You know, it's, it's lively, so the first one was more lively, uh, more healthy, people could walk around. It was from a social point of view, people could actually get together. So that's probably more, again, without defining good or bad, this is you know, the first one that we saw, it's probably more of an, of an example of a good urban design. Uh, in contrast, so sorry, just one more time to look at bad urban design. What we expect is to have something more and more unsustainable, low density, car oriented, no access to shops, maybe food desert. Uh, and so we'll, you know, I think all of us, or at least in the urban design field, maybe even in urban planning, there's some, some elements, some sense of what is good and what is bad. Um, I don't think, I don't think, you know, I, I think this is the, the kind of what you were talking about, the, the cookbooks. I think there are some, some elements, some cookbooks, some, some things that, that we understand. Now let's try to adopt the same approach, but apply it to uh, urban engineering. So again, sorry, one more slide. Um, and when I say urban engineering, really what I mean is um, basically urban planning, but applied to engineering systems. So urban engineering focuses on engineering systems. So there's transport, there's water, there's wastewater, there's electricity, natural gas, light waste, only communications. When we think about all that infrastructure that I say is generally, I mean, I call it the greatest uh, physical manifestation of civilization, which is the, the physical infrastructure that's around us. If I ask you to do the same, what's good, what's bad? What's good urban engineering practices, what's bad engineering practices? Good, you're gonna tell me, well, it's probably something like sustainable, resilient, adaptable, distributed. Uh, if I ask you for bad, you might come up with uh, the terms on sustainable, vulnerable, rigid, centralized. But what, what does that mean, right? If I just show you two pictures of infrastructure, can we easily compare the two? Um, that we have terms that we know are preferable to others, but we don't really necessarily know what they mean, and we don't really necessarily have a cookbook. Uh, something in, in good urban engineering, I could say smart. If it's smart, it's better. So, sorry, there's the next slide. Uh, so, but what is, you know, what is smart infrastructure? Is smart infrastructure the solution, really? Um, so, if we look at what it is, sorry, just one more slide, and you'll see there's three, so maybe you can show the, the, the three of them right away, the three points. Uh, so SI, smart infrastructure, leverages information and communication technology. So we know we're going to have some computing, some sensors, uh, maybe some, some control aspect. Um, we've actually had smart infrastructure for quite a, quite a long time, even since the 1970s and 80s. Uh, we've had SCADA systems. So SCADA systems, I forget what it means. It's uh, supervisory and control, advisory data, something acquisition. Um, it's usually we have that on uh, water systems, on electrical systems, on natural gas systems. So we have sensors in the network. We're measuring, for example, in real time, the volume of water uh, going through a section, going through a pipe. Um, we're measuring the flow rate, um, et cetera, et cetera. We can do the same thing with electricity and that's really giving us some information. So we know that's, that's there. We also have some adaptive traffic control. The easiest example is just a loop detector that can really literally put you know, some, some, uh, a mesh in the road then I know whenever a car is there, so if a car is there, I can adapt and traffic control. So we've had some of that. Um, we have now more and more, we're starting to think about real-time storm water control. So we have those fixed uh, sewer systems that are there and they get overwhelmed very quickly. We get flooding very quickly. So we're trying to put some more real-time, some sensors and to do some real-time control uh, so that we don't get flooding as much in this. And, and the, in the realm of electricity, we'll have something called the smart grid where we're measuring really in real-time how much electricity we need 
um, so we can operate the grid a little bit better. So all of that are examples of smart infrastructure. Um, but I, I get the feeling now that whenever we're putting technology, we assume that whenever we're adding technology, uh, it means good. Technology, however we're doing it, means good. And I don't know if it's necessarily the case. I would, I would, I, I mean, I don't think so. There are certainly there are, there are times when we're adding technology and we're actually making things worse. Um, uh, so that's the question. There is what does the use, uh, but does the use of ICT automatically make infrastructure smart, and does it make it better? Um, in addition to that, sorry if you can, you know, just go one more slide. So really, a smart infrastructure or you know just technology, just connected infrastructure, is it necessarily sustainable? Is it necessarily resilient? Is it necessarily adaptable? Adaptable is actually a big one because for real-time control, you need to be able to measure something. You measure, and based on what you measure, you you know actuate a gate, for example, close you know you close it or you open it. That's adaptable, but is it is it better? Uh, distributed infrastructure is it better? Uh, I don't think we know. I really don't think we know. We're going to have some elements. And then we're going to tell me, yes, look, this is much better. This is much worse. Um, and then, sorry, if we could move on. Then I'm going to tell you, well, we also have interdependencies. So, sorry, then we have the last slide. Uh, if we look at all the infrastructure, so here I have some examples of the UIC campus. We have the 12 kilovolts, so the distribution system, the um, electrical distribution system, the electrical systems, sewers, the water distribution. We have the hot and chilled water there on the bottom left, the natural gas system, the transportation, all the roads, and then all the buildings. And all of these things are interdependent. Um, so even one of the questions that I ask myself all the time is if we're connecting infrastructure, surely we're, we're, we're one, of the thing, one of the things we're doing is to improve the efficiency. We're better able to utilize the capacity that we have. So instead of having you know, fixed capacity, especially like roads, so instead of having you know, more and more roads, we can have the same roads and carry more traffic, uh, thanks to all that technology. But what we're doing is we're now adding some interdependencies or at least some dependencies. So now we depend on all the telecommunication infrastructure. We depend on the ICT. And if that fails, then our system cannot uh, work necessarily properly. So it's actually becoming maybe less resilient. So it might be maybe more sustainable, at least more low energy because we're better utilizing the infrastructure, but it might be becoming less resilient, so more vulnerable. And so really what the end is, you know, what's good urban engineering versus what bad urban engineering? I'll tell you, I don't really know. Uh, again, for urban design, for urban planning, I think we're getting some sense, but I'm not an urban planner, and I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure the two other speakers are going to tell me no, no. Oops, we lost That's you. Bothering me. Oh, there's some. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, and I'm done anyway. That's my big question. You know, does smart, does technology automatically means good? At least from an infrastructure point of view, I don't think it is. And I don't think the answer is obvious. If you give me one technology, I don't think the answer is obvious whether it's good or bad. Uh, so I'm going to leave you to that. And we am hoping that we can talk about that um, in, a, in a few minutes one, once, our, um, once we start the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sibyl. Pierre? All right, OK. Thank you so much for great presentations. Um, so my work focuses on the vertical city. So the vertical city paradigm is a proliferating cities worldwide. And we simply could ask um, why? Uh, so first, uh, urban population increase. Globally, cities are adding about 200,000 urban inhabitants per week. And people desire urban living for job opportunities and better education, among other reasons. Um, today, who wants to live in a farm? Therefore, how can we accommodate um, that increase while fighting urban sprawl? So the argument then build up, not out. Second, demographic change. Millennials and aging populations prefer apartment living over single family houses. Uh, third, a global competition and globalization. Uh, global companies prefer locating in high and high rise buildings. An example would be the city of Shenzhen in China, for example. Uh, in a similar vein, an iconic skyscraper can put the city on the map. One example is Dubai and Burj Khalifa. Uh, fourth, urban regeneration. It is often that such projects happen in high demand areas and it does not make sense to replace older buildings in these areas with low rise development. Fifth, urban agglomeration. There's an economic benefit from locating large concentration of businesses in close proximity. Uh, six, land preservation. Um, by building up, we can make room for green and open spaces. 
seventh land price increase. Uh, skyscraper is a machine that makes land pay. Eighth, climate change. Uh, one way to deal with hazardous flooding is to build up, not out. Nine, infrastructure and transportation. High rises shrink needed infrastructure at the ground floor. Uh, tenth, international finance. Some global investors prefer to place their wealth in fewer properties such as skyscrapers. Uh, air right, it offers an incentive for property owners to make money while doing nothing by just selling their air rights. Uh, Twelve, human aspiration and ego. The skyscrapers are symbols of scientific advancement, sophisticated engineering, and architectural talent. Um, uh, Thirteen, emerging technologies. Skyscrapers have propelled scientific research in areas such as elevators, glazing systems, heating and cooling, and ventilation and the like. Last but not least, profit and greed. Skyscrapers are a lucrative business for architects, engineers, developers, owners, real estate folks, and city benefiting from large taxes. Uh, next slide, please. So, Urban planners have been working diligently to develop the sustainable model. And one of these projects, uh, I coined tall buildings and transit oriented development. Obviously it builds on TOD projects, but here I'm engaging tall buildings, skyscrapers, high rises for the purpose of ensuring healthy density. So healthy density would sustain ridership, which is very critical to sustain mass transit projects. So with this, we are addressing three important urban dimensions, urban planning dimensions, density, distance, and design. Um, so with this model, we are shortening walking distances. We are offering concentrated mixed use environment within walking distances. We are reducing dependence on the automobile and we are creating urban synergy among various uses. For example, knowledge spill. We are reducing actual footprint of the built environment and we are reducing ecological footprint altogether. So at the right, we see the example of Roslyn Boston Corridor in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, it's one of the prominent examples in this country. We can probably relate to it. And uh, to, to the middle here image, we see the concept all right, so concentrating activities around mass transit nodes and making within it walking distances. And then to the right, we see the mixed use uh, scheme for utilizing the land. Next, please. So similarly, architects have been very busy developing what we call the green building models. And one of the promising ones is the plant and the tree covered prototype. So you see here the two images of uh, Bosco Verticale, vertical forest building in Milan, Italy. As you can see, two towers, one 360 feet and one 250 feet high, and they are both residential. The architect is Stefano Boyri. It was completed in 2014. Uh, they host over 900 trees and thousands of shrubs, this project received international recognition. So what are the advantages of a plant and tree covered buildings? As we can see here in the slide, uh, can you move to the next slide, Zarisa? All right, fantastic. So uh, first, improving the environmental health of indoor and outdoor spaces by producing oxygen, filtering polluted air, dust, and reducing urban noise thereby improving people's comfort and productivity, also plants sequestered carbon from the atmosphere. Second, enhancing aesthetics and offering a local vernacular touch when indigenous plants are used. Third, improving habitat resilience and the species survival force and bringing nature closer to the city and softening their urban jungle effect. Fifth, increasing biodiversity by attracting species such as birds, butterflies, snails, cricket, and tree frogs. Six, reducing stress levels of individuals exposed to greeneries. Seven, potentially providing an agricultural source, for example, the vertical farm applications. Eight, protecting from 
uh, graffiti and vandalism, nines enhancing the smell escape, tens protecting the building from the solar load and hence reducing required energy to cool the building during summertime and reducing carbon emission. And finally, these combined factors to use the urban heat island effect and help to combat climate change. So this model is now having a rippling effect worldwide. We see, for example, in Singapore, the Park Royal on Pickering uh, completed in 2013. Next slide. So you see this is a, one of the uh, uh, planned and covered buildings the plant covered buildings uh, here is an example. Here, the next slide is a close up of you. And next slide is one central park in Sydney. Next slide, uh, this project uh, is called uh, 1000 Trees uh, in Shanghai. And finally, the vision now is a broadening from small, small scale to larger scale. So. Forest City tree covered skyscrapers proposed in China. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, um, Karen and Sybil. This is really complementing very well the kind of the broad view with more specific questions about how we can enhance infrastructure, which is um, kind of the prerequisite for any development, and then enhance the way of living. Um, through possibly some efficiencies, uh, but also uh, a strong emphasis on the quality of, um, of living through um, ecology and space, saving of energy and other benefits. So that was quite comprehensive. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot see the uh, question and answer. Uh, Karen, Sybil, if you can pick some from the, uh, from the comments, if there are any. And I will have to stop sharing this uh, screen, even though it's a beautiful picture uh, to keep um, in order to be able to see uh, the rest as well. So here um, and... Uh, yeah, I see a question probably directed to me. Um, do, okay. we know, do, do we know how well the green vertical buildings are holding up over time, both in terms of structure and in terms of function? This is a, a large question because we have many different models and uh, the most recent ones are uh, probably not been through the, um, the, the real time test. So we, we, we are monitoring the progress and the maintenance costs, for example, the performance of these uh, building but uh, some of them are doing better, but we do not really have very conclusive uh, uh, findings uh, because they are relatively new. All right, thank you very much, Kier. Um I had a couple of questions that I already answered by uh, writing. <laughs> okay, you want to give us a synopsis? Is there something general to share? Uh, from those or otherwise, I think there's a question of the uh, question of uh, artificial intelligence and how it can complement the existing uh, trends in uh, infrastructure and digital, how much it can help or not. And then a broader question of um, other priorities that either of you could take or I could take uh, priorities, efficiency versus uh, other goals in terms of uh, public good and, and interest? Uh, these are very, very big questions. Uh, the role of artificial intelligence. Um, I don't know if any of you have, there was a buzz recently in Netflix. Uh, there's a documentary called The Social Dilemma. I don't know if you've heard about it. I don't know. I've, I've, I, I watched it. <laughs> After I watched it, I deleted all my social media apps from my phone. Um, we're being controlled by, by AI, right? We're really being controlled by AI uh, and we don't know how it works. And even Facebook, you know, they don't really know how it works. And, um, and, uh, and it works well for, for something like this, but whenever we talk about infrastructure, it's more difficult because we want to be able to predict what would happen, right? If there's some kind of input, we need to be able to predict what would happen. And so by using um, artificial intelligence, a lot of times we don't. And that's largely, my understanding is that it's largely why autonomous vehicles are not there yet. And they're probably not going to be there for a few years. We really thought that they would. 
Um, everyone said, which sure, now in the next five years, we know we're gonna have autonomous vehicles. And, and we have some, some vehicle, I mean, again, we have different degrees of autonomous vehicles, but the fully autonomous vehicles, it's not there yet um, because artificial intelligence is just not bad predictable. I mean, there's a lot of things that we don't, you know, we don't know what's gonna happen. So the role of artificial intelligence, we know that there's a role, but we know that it's not there yet. I mean, my understanding is it's, it's, it's the engineering approach is, is trial and error. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, you know, we'll do it. We'll try bit by bit and at some point we'll get there. Uh, but right now is just a, a big open question. And um, that's also something that I would not trust necessarily. My, my father-in-law is, is really scared of uh, having robots taking over the world. I'm not scared of that. I'm scared of an algorithm just doing something that we didn't think it would do. And that would mess everything up. Uh, so that's what I'm more, more scared about. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sybil. We have a question from Andrea regarding tree-covered buildings that are very attractive and have many of benefits. Uh, but also, I think it would be good to hear from Pierre a little bit about the impact of COVID and how the tall buildings, particularly the, the ones that are eco-friendly, uh, would be more beneficial or how they relate to the current um, issues with pandemic. Uh, and I think that is also brought in the context of general uh, urbanization and affinity for city living um, in the times like this. Well, recently I, I had uh, some conversations with a prominent practicing architect such as Norman Foster. Um, he believes that uh, this pandemic is going to reinforce the sustainability thesis, is going to push forward to, to embrace sustainability as did uh, uh, several disasters uh, for us throughout history. So we look at it in a very positive perspective people now will appreciate better and healthier environments. So our building's agenda is going to emphasize uh, sustainability, resilience, and this model could be also polished further in order to respond to health problems that we face today. Are there any downsides to? Yes, um, there are some downsides of this building, apparently maintenance, all right? For, for this building, since it is very high, so uh, it always needs what they call them uh, flying gardeners, all right? So they descend uh, along um, long cables and then um, they need to be well-trained in order not to lose their lives as, on the job and, and do a good job simultaneously. So it does have some downsides. Um, there are some projects right now responding to this problem, for example, Oasia building in Singapore did a, a scaffold, almost a skeleton, that where it got just all the plants. So um, we don't need the flying gardens. Anybody could be positioned any floor and do the maintenance. So, so there are creativity here. That's kind of like really the core things about urban planning and architects. Um, always thinks in creative ways to overcome serious problems. Thank you very much. Um, Sybil, do you have any final words? I think we're due to close in about a minute. Uh, contact me. I'm, I'm, I'm seriously, I'm seriously really, I think it's going to be one of my big projects for the next few years is really try to determine whether technology is, and, and it goes back to Lewis Mumford and it goes back to, you know, really from the 1960s, I think they got it right. And we've, we've had it wrong for many, many years. So I'm really trying to just revisit the same questions. So if you have any tips, any suggested readings, please, 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 please send them to me. My email is very easy. It's Darable, like terrible with a D. I always say I'm Dr. Darable. I'm the, the, the evil guy in the James Bond movie. So Darable at uic.edu. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you both. I just like to say, it's, I think it's a fascinating topic. The cities are so complex and dealing with them and developing successful and functional and equitable city uh, and efficient and economically viable is really a challenge. It's not easy. And I think we have a lot of questions. My, again, sense is that we have to move ahead, take the best from the past. But from this presentation, we could also see there's a lot of innovation, a lot of new ideas that could enhance our cities. So how to take them, how to make sure we take the best of technology uh, to actually 
uh, make them sustainable, resilient to the new challenges like pandemics and flooding and new disasters that are happening around and at the same time, kind of keep in mind uh, the quality of life and keep in mind the community, the people that live in the city. So there's a lot of challenges and that's why we are researching and talking about cities. And I think it's been, I know, my lifelong um, kind of uh, topic and occupation and, and the challenge to uh, think and do research about and, and see how we can move toward better practice um, and better cities. So thank you everyone. Thanks to the speakers. Uh, and thank you for all who attended. Um, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the symposium. Uh, this was our morning start. The lunch break comes now and 12.30 uh, uh, it's continuation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.